The third step in a partial fraction decomposition problem is now to solve for these unknown numerators, a, b, c, etc., as far as we need to. We've already factored the denominator, we've written the form of the partial fractions, and now it comes to actually solving for what these values a, b, and c are. To begin, we want to solve this equation that has fractions in it, and generally when we're dealing with equations with fractions, the easiest thing to do is to clear out all the fractions by multiplying by the least common denominator. Now the handy thing here is that we already know the least common denominator. It's this denominator on the left side. So we can multiply both sides by that denominator and that will clear out all of these fractions which will make things solvable for us. So the first step here is always to multiply both sides by the original denominator. in our case, x times x plus 1 squared. And I'm using the factored form here because we have it handy and it makes simplifying a little bit easier. When we do this, the left side will always just simplify to whatever the numerator was before. In our case, the numerator was just 1, so we just get 1. On the right-hand side, when we multiply the first term, a over x, by x times x plus 1 squared, the x's will cancel each other and we'll just have a times x plus 1 squared. Similarly, on the second term, where we have b over x plus 1, now x plus 1 will cancel. So one of these x plus 1's is left, which leaves us with b times x times x plus 1. And then lastly, c over x plus 1 squared, that will cancel with the x plus 1 squared, leaving just c times x for us. So notice that since these partial fractions are built off of that factored form, this will always simplify very nicely just like this, where pieces will cancel and we'll be left with a equation with no fractions left in it. So that's a much simpler equation to solve, but we still have three unknowns in one single equation. So we still need to do a little bit of work to figure out how we can solve for a, b, and c. Again, in general, with one equation we could only solve for one unknown, but it turns out that inside this one equation there are really three equations we can build from it, and each of those will give us the answer for one of these, a, b, and c. Now there are two ways to do this, so I'll show you two methods once you get to this point, but the first step is always to multiply both sides by the original denominator. Once you do that, there are two ways forward, and I'll show you both of them. I generally default to the second method because I think it's a little bit easier, but it's really up to you which one you find easier to work with. In the first method, we notice that on the right side of this equation, when we expand things out, there will be some terms that have x squared in them, some terms that have x's, and some terms that have just constant values. And so what we can do is we can match that up with the left-hand side. If the left-hand side had an x squared term, all of the x squared terms on the right-hand side would have to combine to equal the x squared term on the left. In our case, the x squared term on the left is 0, so all of the x squareds on the right have to combine to be 0. All of the x's on the right have to also combine to be 0, and all the constants on the right have to combine to be 1. And notice that those three statements will each give us an equation, and so we'll have three equations to solve for our three unknowns. So the basic approach is to equate powers of x on both sides of the equation. So we'll go through that in a minute and see how that works. But basically it comes down to all of the x squareds on the right have to equal all the x squareds on the left and so on for x's and the constant values as well. The second approach is to basically pick test values because if 1 is always equal 
to this right hand side. That means it's true for any value of x that we could plug in. So we can plug in three different values of x and each one of them will give us an equation and with those three equations we can solve for the three unknowns a, b, and c. Now the reason that method I think is easier is that if we pick our x values carefully it makes things simple algebraically to solve for a, b, and c. And we'll see how that works in just a minute. But first we'll do this first method of equating the powers of x. So if we start with 1 equals a times x plus 1 squared plus b x x plus 1 plus c x. The first thing we want to do is expand out that right hand side so that we have our x squared terms, x terms, and constant terms that we can combine together. So this would be a times x squared plus 2x plus 1 plus b times x squared plus x plus c times x. And then we can distribute the a, b, and c. ax squared 2ax plus a and bx squared plus bx and cx. Now the idea is again on the left side there's really a 0x squared and a 0x term. If we had those terms non-zero written for us we would use those values but since all we have on the left is 1 the x squared and x coefficients are both 0. So now if we regroup things the x squared terms on the right ax squared and bx squared have to line up with the 0x squared. The x terms on the right, 2ax plus bx plus cx, all have to combine to be 0x. All of those have to combine together. And then the constant term on the right, a, has to combine with nothing to equal the constant term 1 on the left. So we're just lining up and noticing that ax squared plus bx squared must equal 0x squared. 2ax plus bx plus cx must equal 0x and a must equal 1. Just by comparing all the x squareds on the right and all the x squareds on the left, all the x's on both sides and the constants on both sides. Which means that these coefficients a plus b must equal 0 and 2a plus b plus c must also equal 0. So we've got a, a system of three equations with three unknowns, a, b, and c, which normally would be pretty tricky, except that one of the equations gives us one of the answers right away, that a is negative 1. Once we know that, we can look at the other two and say, here, now that we know that a is 1, we can find b in one step from the first equation. b must equal negative 1. Because we have 1 plus b equals 0, we can solve and get b equals negative 1. And then once we know that, we can take both of those answers to this third equation and say 2 times 1 plus negative 1 plus c equals 0, so c also equals negative 1. So when you get down to it, actually solving it is pretty easy because usually one of those equations will give you one of the answers really quickly. So we have our three values a, b, and c. And if you look back at the original problem, that's what we found for a, b, and c. We found that 1 over x cubed plus 2x squared plus x, which was the same as 1 over x times x plus 1 squared, was equal to 1 over x minus 1 over x plus 1 minus 1 over x plus 1 squared. All we've done here is taken that form a over x plus b over x plus 1 plus c over x plus 1 squared and filled in the values for a, b, and c. So that's one approach. One way to find the coefficients a, b, and c is to expand everything out and then equate the powers of x. And if you like that method and it works for you, you can use that every single time. There's no need to do anything different. But I will show you a second method that you can use in case you find that helpful. And that second method, as I said, is to use test values. So we'll go back to this line here where we have the fractions done away with 
and we just have the numerator from the left side equaling all of the terms on the right side multiplied by the common denominator. So once we have that non-fraction version, we'll start back from there and we'll start picking test values to solve for A, B, and C. So our starting point here for the second method is the same place we started when we did the equaling powers of x on both sides. We can plug in chosen values of x, and any value of x we want to choose, we can use. We just need three test values because we have three unknowns, a, b, and c. So you could pick any values you want at all, but if you pick carefully, you can make your life easier. So we could use 12, 17, and 19, but those would be complicated algebraically. If we pick carefully, our numbers will make things easier. So I'm going to choose x equals 0 as one of the test points. Now why did I do that? If you look carefully, when I plug in x equals 0, some of these terms are going to disappear. Specifically, we have an x there and there. So when we plug in 0, both of those terms are going to disappear from the right-hand side, leaving just something with a, which means we can solve directly for a. So what I did was look carefully at these factors and I notice there's an x factor in some of these terms and so if I plug in 0 that will make that piece disappear. So plugging in 0, the left side is just 1 because there's no, nowhere to plug it in. The right side we have a times 0 plus 1 squared, so a times 1 squared, plus b times 0 times 1, so that's all 0, plus c times 0, so that's 0 as well, which means we just immediately figure out that a equals 1. See if you can figure out what the next value I'm going to plug in will be. Looking at these factors, the other factor we notice is an x plus 1. What makes that equal 0? Well, that would be x equals negative 1. So if we plug in negative 1, again the left side will just be 1 because there's no x terms over there. It happens to be in this example. On the right side, the a times x plus 1 squared, that's going to be a times 0 squared, so that'll disappear, plus b times negative 1 times 0, so that disappears as well, and all we have is c times negative 1. So we can again solve directly to find that c is negative 1. Now we've exhausted all of the factors. Because there were repeated factors here, there's no other new factor that we could plug in a value to make it go to zero. So now we have to pick a third value somewhat arbitrarily. I like to use numbers as small as possible, so I'll use one. Uh, so it's a nice round number. It makes the calculations easy. But we could use anything we wanted. And again, for all three of these values, we could pick any values from the whole universe of possibilities. It just turns out that if we're careful, the algebra is much simpler than it could be. So in this case, when I plug in 1, the left side is still 1. The right side I have a times 2 squared plus b times 1 times 2 plus c times 1. But now I can take advantage of the fact that I know what a and c are. So a times 2 squared is just 4, since a is 1, plus 2 times b, and then c is negative 1. So we have minus 1 there. And we can again solve very quickly and find that b equals negative 1 by combining the 4 and negative 1, subtracting them on the other side, and dividing by 2. Very simple, quick algebra to find b. So either way you do it, we again find that 1 over x cubed plus 2x squared plus x equals 1 over x minus 1 over x plus 1 minus 1 over x plus 1 squared. So once you go to solve for a, b, and c, you always start by multiplying both sides by the common denominator, and then you have a choice of how to solve for a, b, and c. You can either expand everything out and set up the powers of x, x squared, and so on equal to each other on both sides, or you can pick these test values. I personally prefer to pick these test values. I find this a little bit easier. But as long as you can do one of these two approaches, you can solve all the problems. Just pick the one that you prefer and stick to that.